Brothers and sisters, we thank the Lord again for this day and this morning. I want us to prepare, and I want us to go back again to a passage of Scripture that wasn't that long ago that we were at, but I'll tell you why we're here. With all that's been going on with the virus, and particularly over these past few days, with the marching and things that's going on in the streets and the reason for it, um, sometimes we as preachers and pastors, we struggle in our study from, from week to week, uh, sometimes in trying to make sure that what we have is what the Lord wants and that things are in order. But it seems like over the past few days, there's been a basket load of things dropped into my mind, my, my heart, uh, to be able to use God's Word to speak about. And it comes up to be one of these sort of things where you don't know quite sure what to deal with first. But I believe that revisiting this passage this morning, we might be able to see something that maybe we did not look to before, which is always the case with God's Word because there's always something more than what we see the first couple of times. So join with me, please, in the book of Genesis chapter 4. Verses 8 through 10. Genesis 4, verses 8 through 10. The scripture says, And Cain talked with Abel his brother. And it came to pass, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother, and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he says, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. I want you to think about this morning. Beware of the language of Cain. Beware of the language of Cain. Father in heaven, as we come now to look to your word, Again, we thank you for the privilege. We thank you for the opportunity. Because, Lord, we realize that you didn't have to let us be here this morning, but you did. So give us insight now further into your word. Bring to my mind and heart things previously studied. So can be brought to bear up on this message that your people in turn might be fed to the glory of your name, that they might be edified. And if there's any among us that does not know you in the part of their sin, that the Holy Spirit might draw them before it's everlasting too late. Please forgive us of all of our sins. Cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. Open down now my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. It's in Jesus' name that we ask it. Amen. <clears throat> Beware <clears throat> of the language of Cain. You don't have to turn to each of these passages of Scripture that if you've got your camera on or your screen on, you can see them listed there. Um, you don't have to turn to these. But I've listed these here for this reason. is because each one of them speaks in support of what this message is about. And these by no means are the only passages. Luke writes in Luke chapter 6, verse 31, And as ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans 12:3, For I say through the grace given unto me, that every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. John, the Apostle John writes in chapter 3, verses 34 and 35, <clears throat> A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. This same John writes in the epistle of 1 John chapter 3, verse 10, and this is the ch and this in this the children of God are manifest, and the children uh, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. 
John writes in that same chapter, first, um, chapter 3, verse 16, Whereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. John writes in 1 John 4 and 8, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. There are various languages throughout the world. There's national languages. In other words, there's English, there's Japanese, there's German, there's Spanish, there's Italian, and there are many other languages that go with the cultural people or national of people throughout the world. There's a cultural language. And we as a people, as a culture, in these United States, have a language that's different from other cultures that's in the world that's not necessarily related to speaking language, but the way that we interpret things and the gestures and the phrases uh, uh, and things that we use. It kind of reminds me of generational language. Uh, I can remember when I was coming up and some of my generational language was when we saw something that we really liked or when we saw something that uh, we thought was really good, we would use the term, man, that is really bad. And and, and we would have our own little uh, physical gesture to go along with that, to say, man, that is really bad. Well, that culture, that, that, that generational language was using a term that was usually identified for identifying bad or negative things, but turning it around to use it to say, that's really good. That's really nice. I like that. That's really bad. <clears throat> and when we speak in to some of the languages of, of some of the young people today, we hear them saying some other things. I tried to remember some of these things. I should have called up my grandkids and kind of gotten some, gotten some instruction, but I failed to do that. But I've heard them say, use different words uh, to communicate when something is that they like is great and they've got their own language about when something is not too great we used to say that when somebody's broken up broke up here's a term where you know get on down the road or hit the road jack don't you come back no more i know that some of you all listen to me know that song but we actually use that term but today we hear the generation say well people getting kicked to the curb uh, and things like it. It's a generational language. There's a language that goes with ethnicity. We as black people in this nation have a way of using language and speaking to each other. And so did our foreparents, even during slavery, of speaking to each other in a way that others who were not part of us just did not understand. And that goes on even right today when we recognize that we're not the only ones, that there are other ethnic cultures as well that have their way of communicating to each other to, signal, to send a signal that they're hoping nobody else will be able to pick up. There's a signal in the term, we want to take back our country. There's a signal in the term, I'm a, I'm, I'm, I'm a president of law and order. Those, those, those are signal terms, and it's targeted at a particular people uh, to get ready for a particular thing. <laughs> Of the saved people, saved people have a language. We have a language that belongs only to the saved. Even the scripture says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. There's songs that only the redeemed can sing. There's, some, there's, there's a language that only sinners have. And since all of us that are saved used to be sinners, and some of us are still slipping and sliding and twisting and turning, we know what that language of having, unbeen, or of having not been saved really is. There's a language of love, and there's a language of hate. Death got up and took a seat when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. The seat that it took was a ruler's seat. So that when Adam sinned, now upon every soul that would be born in this world, after that, death would have a rulership in that person's life and in that person's mind. And the first elements of this, that death has taken a seat, shows up in this passage. 
because within the confines of Adam and Eve's own family, death now appears. Murder now appears. And we don't have to worry about, um, didn't, well, real, what I'm trying to say is we really didn't have to worry about when it was going to show up. It had intended to show up, and it did show up right in the midst, right there in the garden. The first one who dies turns out to be a saint. The first one to ever be murdered is a saint. Well, why do you say that, Pastor? Abel was considered, even at this time, a saint. What Abel did, the way Abel obeyed God, God accepted him. Even his offering, who was in the category of a worship, God accepted and respected Abel. Cain, on the other hand, was like the attitude of many in this day. We want to offer God what we want to offer him. We want to do it our way. We get jealous of what others have to offer. We get jealous when God blesses someone else and we think he's not paying attention to us. Cain turns around to be the opposite. So the first one then who ends up dying after creation is Abel, Cain's brother. The first one to go to the grave and the first one to go into the presence of God after death is Abel. And let us not think it strange that because when tests and trials and things like that come to us, brothers and sisters, sometimes we might be called upon to die for the Lord. Sometimes he may want to use us to bring about another type of a change. That's part of the reason I believe that John, that John writes in Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. Even though Jesus has instructed him to write this to a church, it is not something that can just be taken by the church, but something by, that can be taken by every born-again believer. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. Between verses 9 and 12, these are some things that we will look at. First of all, we have a full account that's going on because now that Cain has killed Abel, now Cain is being called into what you might say a trial. God is questioning him. God is showing up. God himself is the seated judge. Let us not forget that he is the great judge of all the earth. <clears throat> I realize that we've got local judges, we've got municipal judges, we've got state Supreme Court judges, we've got national Supreme Court judges, uh, and things like that. But we have to remember that there's another judge who sits above all judges. We often speak of him as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Well, let me submit to you this morning that he's also the judge of judges. The, pro the thing here is, though, that God makes no mistakes. He understands and he sees it all. He doesn't have to take four days, four months, four weeks to collect the evidence because the evidence was before him even before you got here. He is the great judge of all the earth. And now he calls Cain into question as it relates to what happened to his brother. Cain is put on a spot where he can't do anything but either acknowledge the truth or lie. <laughs> And he takes a very bad attitude, which we'll see here in a minute, that causes a language to come from Cain that you and I need to be careful of. And when it comes to this matter of bloodshed, we need to remember that God pays attention to the bloodshed of people and particularly the bloodshed of those that belong to him. Abel had been in the habit of bringing an offering before the Lord. Abel had been in the habit of worshiping God. Abel had been in the habit of having communion and fellowship with God. As, as, as all of that that could be permitted during that particular time, Abel was in the habit of that. But there, if I, if I might use this term, because I heard someone say this one time, <clears throat> that Abel, uh, when it came time for worship, the Lord looked around and saw that Abel was missing, that Abel was missing 
out of the service. He looked down because he recognizes those who assembled before him. And I might put a pin right there to cause us to think about this uh, church. Even in this day and time, the Lord sees and knows everyone who is assembled before him in worship. He knows when we are absent, and he knows why we are absent. He knows when we're making excuses, and he knows when there's really something that's blocking our way. He pays attention when we're absent from his presence, absent from worship. God confronted Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3 about their sin, and Adam and Eve at least came forth and confessed. But here what we learn from Cain is, is that Cain lies to God outright. He outright lies straight in the face of God, denying any knowledge of his brother's whereabouts. He lied because Cain was the last one to see him. Now keep in mind, at the time Cain lived, the world was not full of people. At the time Cain lived, lived, there weren't seven billion people on the face of the earth like there is now. At the time Cain lived, there wasn't the United States or Germany or Europe or an Australia and places like that. At the time that Cain lived, at this particular time, there were only four people on the face of the earth, Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel. So Cain was the last one to see his brother alive. And Cain lied because he was the only one who knew where his brother was because Cain is the one who put him there because Cain killed him. The fact of the matter that we need to understand is Cain is demonstrating an attitude where he does not care either about his brother or the God that he serves. Now, that might sound like a strange thing, but brothers and sisters, when we lie about the truth, when we, retreat, when we refuse to walk in a way of righteousness, when we know what the Lord expects and we refuse to do it, we too are, are, are lying and going contrary right in God's face. He's trying to cover up his action. But the scriptures say there is nothing that, that can be covered. God knows everything that we do. He knows every word that we speak. He knows every attitude and disposition that you and I have. As a matter of fact, I don't want to get too deep with it this morning, but according to scriptures, every word, every thought, every motive, every deed, every action, uh, everything that you would ever do when in this life, God already had written in a book before you got here. So we can't say anything. We can't do anything. We can't think anything that wasn't already written about us before. So Cain is trying to cover up something that God already knew about. He's trying to cover up his actions. But one of the things that we need to remember, remind ourselves of, and it is we cannot hide from God. You might hide from the police. You might hide from the FBI. We might even hide from each other. But we cannot hide from God. If you have any doubt about that, then I would ask you to talk to Brother Jonah. And he will let you know you can run, but you can't hide um, and everything. We cannot hide from God. The Lord already knows. And the Lord already knew what happened to Abel, and he already knew what Cain had done. But Cain still tries to say that he is not guilty. Look at the response that he gives to the Lord when the Lord asks him, Where is thy brother? He, he, he answers the Lord with an attitude. He asks, answers the Lord with a disposition. Am I my brother's keeper? In other words, that's sarcasm. That's bodaciousness. That's arrogance to turn around and ask the creator of the earth, the one who put breath in your body, the one who's talking directly to you. Cain was able to hear God's voice. He was able to communicate directly with God. And for him to turn around and say, am I my brother's keeper, shows you the arrogance, the disrespect, the dishonor, the lack of recognition, the lack of worship that Cain did not have in his heart, speaking to, to God, Almighty God, am I my brother's keeper? Well, what this does for us, let's take a look. It shares with us three things I want to share with you, and then we'll try not to make this, try not to make this too, too long. But the first thing I want you to see is this, that there's responsibility 
that goes along with being the keeper. There's responsibility that goes along with being the keeper. The Lord asked the question, um, where is thy brother? And when, when they asked this question, church, I want you to take a look at what is, that is what it's saying. In verse 9, the Lord said to Cain, where is thy brother? Now, in that, wrapped up in that question, where is thy brother? He's bringing it to Cain because he wants Cain to recognize that there is supposed to be a relationship between he and his brother. He's asking to Cain this question because there's supposed to be a special connection. This is your brother. You might not know everything, but you ought to know some things. You not, may not be able to answer every question, and, and you might not be responsible for everything, but you need to understand that because you are connected, because you're in this special relationship, because he is to you who he is, you ought to know some things about your brother. Where is your brother? And, and, and he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? In other words, if Cain had understood what his responsibility was, then he would have been practicing what, what Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 6, verse 2 and 3. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 2 and 3, Paul writes this, Bear you one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. If Cain had understood the, the motive, the intent, the purpose behind, behind uh, God's question, Cain would have understood that part of his role as being Abel's brother was to be a protector, <clears throat> not, not someone who's going to kill. Cain would have understood, as you and I need to understand, that part of being a keeper is to be a provider, one who helps supplies another's need. We would understand that being our brother's keeper means to be a promoter, in other words, one who directs and encourages and tries to uplift. We would understand that being our brother's keeper involves sometimes being a peacemaker, whether we're not looking to kick them to the curb, we're not looking to send them down the road, we're not looking to ostracize them and criticize them, and we're certainly not looking to take their life. A peacemaker is one who is a reconciler, wanting to put things back together. Where is your brother? Am I my brother's keeper? Yes, you are. Yes, we are. In other words, look out for the welfare of another. But Cain chose the path of a killer and not the path of a keeper. So let's take a look then at the evasiveness of a killer. This is, this is point number two. The evasive, evasiveness of a killer. Take again a look at verse 9. It says, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? Cain not only denies knowing anything about Abel's fate, he defiantly objects that he should even be responsible for looking out for his brother. Am I my brother's keeper? Cain's sarcasm was really what someone said comes down to be a play on words. In other words, I'm, I'm a farmer. I till the ground. Abel is the one who took care of sheep. So am I my brother's keeper? Do you expect me to watch out for my brother like my brother walk, walk, watches out for sheep? Am I my brother's keeper? Do you see, this, do you see this, the, the sarcasm of Cain's statement? Do you see the seriousness of Cain's statement? Cain's plea was he pleads not guilty before God and adds to that the rebellion. In other words, he endeavors, he endeavors to cover up his deliberate murder with a deliberate lie. And don't you know that's, that's what sin will do to us? We'll do one sin and then we'll turn around and we'll have to do another deliberate sin to cover up that other sin that we did deliberately and we have to cover up, do another deliberate sin to cover up for that sin. That's why some say that when you tell the truth, you don't have to have a good memory. Because you see, if you lie, now you've got to remember what you said the last time. And if you don't tell, say the same thing this time that you said the last time, then you end up getting caught in a lie. That's why that when we tell the truth, we don't have to have a good memory because the truth is going to be the same no matter what. Cain tried to cover it up. He tried to declare that I'm not guilty. He adds to it a sense of rebellion, like that's going to get him some points and get him away from what God is doing. 
people who are unsaved, and yes, even some of us who are saved because we're still in this flesh, have to be mindful that sin will cause our minds to be blinded about what God would have us to see and to do. Yes, even though we are saved, if we're not careful, sin can still blind our minds, hinder our vision, uh, 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 blur our vision of what it is that God wants us to see and to be. Our hearts can become hardened and made deceitful all by sin. Yes, even though we've been redeemed, if we're not careful, we can allow sin to harden our hearts so that we don't look at each other the way that we ought to. We don't respect each other as brothers and sisters the way that we ought to. We show more dis- despise this despisedness than we do love for one another. That's why there's so many passages of Scripture that's commanding us to love one another, reminding us that God is love, reminding us that uh, uh, if, if we belong to God, then we ought to be showing forth his love. It's because sin will harden our hearts against our brothers and our sisters. Something is wrong when we stop and think that we can conceal or hide anything from God. Let me tell you something, church, and I know that you know this. I know I'm preaching to the choir this morning, but let me say it so you can preach it to somebody else. God already knows the wrong you're going to do tomorrow if he lets you get up. He already knows the wrong you're going to do, be it, be it in your mind, in your words, in your attitude, in your disposition, in your motives, whatever is on tomorrow, if God allows you and I to get up, he already knows the sin we're going to commit in that particular in that particular day. He already knows that. And, and so you and I need to remember, you, you and I need to understand that, that um, um, God, nothing can be hidden from God. I'm sorry, my phone is going off and I can't cut it off. I, I thought I'd turn that thing off. But I'm, hold on one second, church. I'll get this turned off so it's not so disrupting to us. Okay. I'm sorry. I did but I had this thing turned off. Next time I turn it completely off. But anyway, what I was saying, it's probably just the devil because he didn't want me saying what I was getting ready to say next. Um, we need to remember that we can't hide anything at all from the Lord. He sees everything that we do. God charges, or rather Cain charges God. Can you get this in your mind? Cain charges God, in essence, with being unjust. In other words, why are you bringing this to me? Why are you bringing this question to me? Am I my brother's keeper? You're putting something on me that don't belong to me. That's not fair. Am I my brother's keeper? Which Cain should have done, what he should have humbled himself before God and said, yes, Lord, I know who my brother is because I let my passion get the best of me. I realized that you warned me it was there, but I found myself submitted to it anyway, and I end up taking my brother's life. Now, Cain didn't do that. Cain decided that, 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 that I'm going to defend myself anyway. So he flies in the face of God himself. It says to ask him the question. In other words, God, you're asking me, where is my brother? I'm asking you if I'm my brother's keeper. Surely he's old enough that he can take care of himself. Why do I have to watch? Some seem to reflect that God is, that, 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 that King is asking God and taking God to task. Saying, well, Lord, since you are who you are. You ought to know where he is. You're the one who made him. You're the one who's got track of us all. It's your job to keep up with him, not mine. Now, brothers and sisters, this might sound strange, 
You've never heard this presented this way before, but I told you, when we look back at God's word and study God's word, and particularly when circumstances around us seem to present themselves in a way that they haven't before, we, God reveals something out of his word that we have passed over all this time. And even though we've read it hundreds of times and, and studied it many of times and preached from it many of times, here again is something new. Cain is blaming God to say, God, look, you're the one, you're the one who made everything. You're the one who's supposed to be the overseer. Uh, why are you looking for me to keep up with my brother? That, 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 that's your job. It's not my fault that he's missing. You're the one who should have kept track of him. Am I my brother's keeper? A genuine concern, church, for our brothers and sisters as their keeper is a great responsibility. And the fact of the matter is that many times we don't realize just how great a responsibility it is. And because we fail to realize how great a responsibility it is, unfortunately we end up neglecting, and as a result of that, speaking the language of Cain. Those who are unconcerned take no care when they have opportunity. They don't take any care to prevent any hurt from somebody else. They don't take any care to provide some goods and resources. They don't take any care to guard someone's good name. And especially they don't take any care to take time to witness to someone and share with them about, about the good news of Jesus Christ. They speak Cain's language. Paul says in Philippians 2.4, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Cain language says, I don't have time. Cain language says, I don't care. It says, it's not my problem. I'll do whatever it takes to get what I want, even if it means killing you. That's Cain language. Racism cannot exist unless somebody is speaking Cain language. Fatherless children cannot exist in, in, in homes without fathers unless those men are speaking Cain language. Women wouldn't be forced to do things that God never intended for them to do unless men are speaking Cain language. The reason why politicians can talk about money more than they care about the people that, 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 that elected to serve them is because they're more concerned about Cain language. People who wear police uniforms see no problem with sitting on a man's neck, killing him. No problem with shooting first and asking, uh, asking questions later. No problem with pushing a 75-year-old man down for, and causing him to bump his head and to bleed from his head and walk over him like he's trash in the street. This is, a, this is an example of Cain language. It's not just police, brothers and sisters, but you and I, too, if we are not careful, will find ourselves speaking Cain language. And let me show you, we've been in a pandemic since March. We've been in, we've been in a pandemic, a disease that's still uh, running through this rampant through this nation. People are still getting sick. There are people still passing away. And yet you'll find people saying, I'm not going to wear a mask. I'm not going to do this, and I'm not going to do that. I want my freedom. And it's not for me to wear. Oh, yes, it is. Because that mask isn't just about you. It's about you protecting your brother. You might not be able to. You might not have something. But the fact of the matter is, is you don't know where I've been, and I don't know where you've been. So if I put on a mask and you put on a mask, then what we're doing is protecting each other. We're, wa we're watching out for each other. I, he I heard a lady one time say on the TV, and I think I heard it again here not too long ago, where some, I don't know where some people get the idea of thinking, well, I don't need to wear a mask. I'm covered by the blood of Jesus. That's nonsense. God never told us that. The devil tried to tempt Jesus in Matthew chapter 4. It says, jump on down off of this high mountain. God will catch you. In other words, put yourself in harm's way. God will stop it. You're covered. The devil wants you to believe that lie. I bet you the same people who think they don't need to wear a mask because they're covered by the blood of Jesus will not stand in front of a speeding freight train and say, this train's not going to kill me because I'm covered by the blood of Jesus. There's a faith. And there's a foolishness. And, and a lot of people are dealing with foolishness because they're speaking the language of Cain. The conviction of Cain, we see in verse 10 then, the language that Cain, uh, um, the conviction that Cain brings, because in verse 10, he says, God asked Cain a question. What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. What 
have you done? You've seen your brothers uh, destitute. What have you done? You've seen your brothers in, in hunger. What have you done? You've seen your brothers naked. What have you done? You've seen the children in the streets and homeless. What have you done? What have you done with your brother? We're ta- we're, 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 God is telling Cain, you're taking this too lightly. Has you, have you even stopped to consider the, the, how evil the thing is that you've done? Have you even stopped to consider how deep the stain goes, how heavy the burden is, how great the guilt is upon you? You think it's hidden. You think the evidence that there's no evidence against you, but you really need to think again because I've got the whole record right here. Well, let me begin to close as we take a look further than at verse 10 because the proof is in the blood. The proof is in the blood. Take a look at verse 10. And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy blood, the voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. <clears throat> the proof is in the blood. God reveals to Cain that he knows what he did. Abel's blood provides a witness to Cain's guilt. The voice of thy brother's blood cries. God's own knowledge, the fact that God knows, and God's own justice demands an answer. It might not seem like it, church, but God answers crying blood. Murder is a crying blood. Blood calls for blood. When a murder takes place, then the blood of the murderer calls, calls out. It's a crying blood. Brother preachers, for those that listen to me, in the book of Ezekiel by the prophet Ezekiel, chapter 33, where God speaks to Ezekiel and sets him as a watchman, he says, Watchman, I have set you to be my watchman, and when you see the sword coming, if you cry and sound the trumpet, and the people will not listen to you, and they, and they perish, they shall perish, and their blood shall be upon their own head. But if you see the sword coming, and I've and, and, and I prepared you to see what's coming, and you will not warn the people, you will not sound the trumpet, so that the people can be warned and be prepared. He says, when they die, they're going to die in their iniquity, and their blood I will require at your hand. God answers crying blood. In those souls that we see in Revelations chapter 6 that are under the altar, the souls of those saints who have died for the Lord, they're crying out, Lord, holy art thou, how long, how long? What is it that they're crying for? They're crying out, Lord, when, you're, when are you going to avenge our blood? When are you going to avenge the suffering that we went through? When, when are you going to avenge uh, 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 us being cut off and cut down? When are you going to avenge? God answers crying blood. Those who patiently suffer, don't say a word, but take abuse anyway, cries out in their spirit, and God considers it crying blood. They might hold their peace, and they may not cry out real loud for everybody else to hear, but the spirit and the emotion and the mentalness of man has its own voice that can reach heaven, and when we cry out, God is able to hear because God answers crying blood. Blood is said to cry from the ground. In other words, what Abel did was bury Cain. He covered him up some kind of way. But the, pro- the thing about it is, is Cain didn't bury him so deep that God could not hear the blood of Abel crying. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 35, in Matthew chapter 23, verse 35, Jesus says this, that upon you, talking about the Pharisees, upon you, may come all the unrighteous blood, or all the righteous blood shed upon the earth. For the blood of the righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, son of Barachus, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. In other words, when we stop to think about what Jesus is telling the scribes and the Pharisees, because it's in this chapter that he's addressing them as, as, as hypocrites and everything, God counts Every blood drop. You, you remember Jesus said, not a sparrow can fall from the air without the Father knowing it. Well, let me tell you something that you don't know. God counts every blood drop. God counts every tear. He answers crying blood. 
oh well, it's for, it, I'm, I'm glad to say, that, to say this, that when it comes to the blood, Abel isn't the only one who shed some blood. Jesus also shed some blood. Abel's blood cried for vengeance, but the blood of Jesus cries for pardon. Abel's blood cried for the, says a murder is, has been committed, but the blood of Christ speaks and redemption and salvation is spoken of. Abel's blood cries for vengeance, as I've said, but Christ's blood cries for peace and forgiveness. We've seen in these streets these past few days marchers all over the place talking about carrying signs, shouting, Black Lives Matter. But it didn't. I'm going to tell you something this morning. It did not, that march did not, stop, did not start a few days ago. That march started over 2,000 years ago. Why do you say that, Brother Pastor? Because you remember when Jesus was marching on his way to Calvary, the Bible says he stumbled under the weight of the cross. And the, when he stumbled under the weight of the cross and was not able to go any further with it himself, the Roman soldiers walk over. Now keep this in mind. Out of all of these people who are lying in both sides of the street, out of all of these people who are standing there, some of them crying, some of them shouting, some of them are still saying crucifying. Out of all of these people, it's a black man that they walk over and pick out of the crowd and walk over and cause him to begin to carry the cross of Jesus. Jesus looks at him, and they walk on up to Ward Calvary's Hill together. In other words, I want you to know that the March for Black Lives did not start in Minnesota a few days ago. It started 2,000 years ago when it was a black man that picked up the cross and walked with Jesus. This same Jesus understood the cry of a black man as he laid on the ground and, and crying for his mother because when he looked down from the cross and saw his mother, he took care of his mother. It was a, it, it, Jesus understood the cry of this black man that said, I cannot breathe because one of the horrific things of crucifixion was that you were not able to breathe and push yourself up. That's the reason why the soldiers came along to break the legs of the, of, of, of the men that were hanging there because they wanted the men dead before the sun went down. But they broke the legs of the two thieves so that they could not use their legs to press up from, from the cross to take a breath. In other words, they were asphyxiated. Their breath was taken away. But when they came to Jesus, he was already dead. you know why? Because nobody was going to take his life. He gave his life. He decided to stop breathing. So this march did not start just a few days ago. This march started a long time ago. It started in the United States. And, and it's almost like the Lord says, I see what's happening. I know what you're going through. I know the struggle, and I realize that there's a burden on you that's heavy. i tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to start a march in Minnesota. I'm going to send it to Texas. I'm going to send it to Colorado. I'm going to send it to Missouri. I'm going to send it to Kansas. I'm going to send it to New York. I'm going to send it to Montana. I'm going to send it to Nevada. I'm going to send it to California. I'm going to send it to Iowa. But this time... I'm not going to stop there. I'm going to send it to some tennis players that's going to speak up. I'm going to send it to some basketball players that's going to speak up. I'm going to send it to some f football players that's going to speak up. I'm going to send it to some commissioners. I'm going to have some, some police chiefs march in the, in the streets with you. I'm going to cause them to speak up. I'm going to call some DA officers to begin to speak up. I'm going to call some governors to begin to speak up. And if that's not enough, I'm going to have some people in Canada start to march. I'm going to have some people in London start to march. I'm going to have some people in Australia start to march. I'm going to have some people in Japan start to march, in Korea start to march, in the Netherlands start to march, in Germany start to march, in Africa start to march. Jesus says black lives matter. But I got news for you, church. We got to remember something. Jesus is not just concerned about black lives. He's concerned about all lives. White lives, brown lives, red lives, yellow lives. Why? Because all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Thank God that while there's questions that we don't have answers to, there's things that we don't understand, still there's a hymn in the hymn book that we can hang on to and sing every now and then to keep us moving forward because the God that we serve is able, and one of these days he's going to answer the cry of the crying blood. There's a song that says, Tempted and Tried. We're so often wondering why it should be thus all the day long while there are others living about us, never molested, Though in the wrong, Father alone will know all about it. Father alone will understand why. Cheer up, my brother, and live in the sunshine. We'll understand it better by and by. When death has come and taken our loved ones, 
it leaves our home so lonely and drear. And then do we wonder why others prosper, living so wicked year after year. But when I see Jesus coming in glory, when he comes down from his throne, in the, in, from his home uh, in the sky, then we shall meet him in that bright mansion. We'll understand it better by and by. Farther along, we'll understand. I want to tell you, church, that yes, there's marching, and I believe it's at the hand of God all over this world. And even though, even though there's marching, there's still a lot of things to be done. We don't know how come it's taking so long. Things are not fixed yet. We don't know what the end's going to be as far as the, some particular things right now. But farther along, we will understand it. But in the meantime, you and I need to be careful that you and I also are not guilty of adopting Cain language. Father in heaven, we come this morning to thank you in the name of Jesus for allowing us to be here and to share these few words. We hope that it's been an encouragement to these, your people, an edification to these, your people, a warning to those who continue to want to keep their minds and their hearts closed. Thank you for the hope to realize that no matter what it is that we face, we know that you set high and look low, and in your own time, in your own way, you will answer it. Thank you, Lord, for answering countless years of prayers that now seem to be getting some attention. We realize that sometimes tragedy has to come, and yes, a life has to be taken sometimes, even for a change to take place. But we recognize that that's exactly what you did on Calvary. The life of Jesus had to be given in order that I and many others could be saved. Thank you so much. But we also thank you, Lord, that he didn't stay dead. But early Sunday morning, he rose three days later from the grave with all power in heaven and earth in his hands. We look forward to another building, eternal in the heavens, not made by hand. No more racism, no more criticism, no more police brutality, no more sickness, no more suffering, no more dying, no more growing older, no more pains and, and all these other things. All these things will have been wiped away. Thank you, Lord, for one more day to walk closer to you than we did before. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Brothers and sisters, I want to take this time... <clears throat> Extend the invitation of Christian discipleship. There might be one that's been listening to me this morning that does not know Jesus and the pardon of their sin. I want you to know that God loves you. He said, the day that you hear my voice, harden not your heart. He said, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. He said, if any man will open up, I will come in and sup with him. And he with me. I want you to know this morning, he cares. He cares for you. He proved that over 2,000 years ago on a hill called Calvary. But he will not make you come. He will not make you accept his free offer of salvation. You need to acknowledge. You don't need to be like Cain. You don't need to try to justify yourself before God because you can't. I don't care if you've only done one thing wrong in your life. That one thing is enough to keep you out of heaven unless something takes care of that sin. And you can't take care of it. Only the blood of Jesus is able to take care of it. John says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And certainly we invite you this morning, if you do not know him, in the pardon of your sin, I'm going to, since we're on this conference call and have to do it this way, I'm going to do it this way and ask you to give me a call, 816-509-1247. That's 816-509-1247. Give me a call. I'll be happy to talk with you, share some passages of Scripture with you, pray with you so that when we hang up from that phone call, you don't have to have any doubt about your salvation. And then when you have called and we have shared together, your next responsibility then is going to be to go and unite yourself with a Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church uh, and let, you, let the pastor there know what it is that you have done. And he's going to have you come forward so that that can be presented to the congregation. And the reason why he's going to do that is because, remember, Jesus said, if you're ashamed to own me before men, I'll be ashamed to own you before my Father, which is in heaven. So if there's one here today who's listened to me that does not know Jesus, I invite you to give me a call um, as soon as you can, 816 816- Five zero nine one two four seven, and I'll be more than happy to share with you what God has said and what it is that He is offering you. At this time, we're going to ask Sister Bogus if she will give us our invitational song. Sister Sister Faye, are you on? Yes, I am. Okay. 
Yes, Pastor. Okay. The blood that Jesus shed for me way back on Calvary. The blood that gives me strength from day to day, it will never lose its power. Oh, Thank you so much, Sister Boggles. We certainly appreciate that. And again, if there's anyone connected, I would invite you to give me a call. Certainly hope that what was shared today provided some inspiration, some strength, some insight, and some encouragement to keep pressing on, brothers and sisters, in the name of the Lord. Yes, these are difficult times. Yes, these are challenging times. But I try to remind us each and every week or every other week that while this world is struggling with some things right now, it's still not as bad as it's going to be. But thanks be unto God that when things get worse, when this tribulation period gets here, you and I won't be here. The Lord will have taken us out completely out of the way. 
uh, before that even gets here by, by way of the rapture. But while we are here, we have the responsibility of being our brother's keeper. And that, that don't mean just the ones you know the name of. That means those that we don't know. That when God has given us the ability, the resource, the talent, the wherewithal to be an encouragement, to supply a need or something like that, yes, we are our brother's keeper. Amen. Um, let's close up, bow our heads for the benediction. Or just before I do, again, I want to remind you about the um, coronavirus test uh, on the church park a lot this Thursday from 11 to 4. Uh, I like to have, we've got one person, but I like to have uh, at least um, uh, four or five others that we can have over there in pairs on the property inside the building. You don't have to be outside or anything like that, but just inside the building uh, for when the nurses need to come in. Nobody else will be coming into the building uh, except the nurses as they need to. Uh, and But uh, we like to rotate some teams. Uh, maybe have two there for a while, and maybe two others can come in. Uh, and then after that, maybe a couple of others can come in until uh, the testing period is over with. So if anybody listening would like to uh, be a part of that, then contact me as soon as possible so I can give this information to our chairman of trustees, and then we can uh, be ready to go. All right, let's bow our heads to close. Father, again, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this, your word. But as always, Lord, our plea and cry before you is that you just not let it be in our heads. <laughs> Don't let it just be comforting to us to, for it to have gone into our ears. But let it filter down, Lord, into our hearts. Let it find fertile ground in our hearts that what you're calling us to be, even in a time like this, that what you're calling us to be um, will bring forth fruit to the glory of your name. Dismiss us now, we pray, in Jesus' name. Now, with the grace of God, the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, rest, rule, and abide with every true believer here and elsewhere, when we all say together, Amen. <laughs>